my message today. While I'm singing, if you want to go ahead and turn to Acts, the third chapter. <clears throat> I don't know if the fireplace is caught up with me or the dry heat or what, but boy, I don't have much of a voice today. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than have
And I felt like the Lord uh, led my heart to uh, let us this, lead us this way today and preach on this. The scripture says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. By the way, that's three o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that had entered into the temple, uh, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And it's not in your Bible and it's not in mine, but I'd like to imagine it about right here. God said, watch this. Verse 7 says, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people <laughs> ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. You may be seated. This morning I'd like to simply entitle my message, Watch This, The Power of Jesus' Name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again this morning. We do thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us back to this place to worship today and for this good number that's made it. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be with those that cannot be with us today. We know there's still a lot of illness, a lot of sickness in our community here we know there are folks that may be on the road today, whatever it might be, but we pray you bring them back to us very soon. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of the Word this morning, and thank you for this great story that has meant so much to me for almost 40 years now. This has been such a special story. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to work through me today to preach this message. I pray that if there's someone here today that's been lame in sin since their mother's womb as we spiritualize this story. I pray that they'll see today that it doesn't matter how long it's been that they've been in sin, that you want to save them today. You want to help them realize they've been redeemed by the blood of the precious Lamb of God. Now, Father, I pray that all of us would leave here encouraged and strengthened. Uh, may we have a, a, an extra bounce in our step when we leave here today because We've seen what God can do in someone's life. Now, Father, we pray that you have your will in your way in the remainder of this service. Bless my voice. Dear God, I, I don't know what's caused it to be this way, but I'm a little on the rough side. And I pray you give me plenty of voice today to preach this message. And we'll pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, this story is so special to me. There are two reasons why it is special. Uh, for one thing... Uh, when I answered my call to preach, I answered it on a, uh, I guess, I don't remember what night of the week it was now. It was October 17th of 1984, and I answered my call to preach, and two days later, I was on my way to Kingsport, Tennessee, uh, to a huge church convention out there. Hundreds and hundreds of people were there, mostly preachers and their wives, and uh, they asked for a, every preacher to stand and tell who they were and where they were from. And on the night uh, that I did that, I stood along with uh, several, many others in the congregation. And I was over in this part, and they started over here, and it went all the way over. And like, like I said, several hundred people there. And it came my turn, and I said, my name's Kevin Hilton. I'm from Monette, Missouri. And I just answered my call to preach two nights ago, and there was a lot of amens, and I said, yeah. Well, after the service that night, there were people that came up to me, and they congratulated me on graduating from seminary. And I said, I've never been to seminary. And they said, we thought you answered your call to preach. 
And I said, I did. God called me to preach. I haven't been to seminary. And they said, well, we've never heard of that before. Didn't know that you could preach and not go to seminary. Well, I kind of caused a little bit of a question in my mind. Then I visited with a few other people and they asked where my wife was. Was she not able to be at the convention? And I said, I'm not married. I don't even have a girlfriend. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, we've never heard of a preacher not being married before. Well, those two things alone began to cause doubt in my mind. And sometime later, I'm back in Aurora, Missouri. I'm now dating Beth. Uh, and I've got an apartment on the north side of Aurora. And I'm sitting on my couch and I'm reading about this lame man that sat at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. And asking alms of all these people. And I see where the people look on Peter and John and see that they are ignorant and unlearned men. And I've told the story many times. I became very happy. I shouted. I cried. I, I laughed. I had, a, I had myself a fit is what I did. And the whole reason <clears throat> was because this story gave me peace in my heart. I didn't have to go to seminary. It wasn't necessary to be called to preach. And I am married. And I'm glad I'm married. And I'm got, glad I've got the two kids that we have. Uh, but it wasn't necessary that a man be married to preach the Word of God. So that's one reason. The other reason this story is so special to me, and I don't preach it, and I'm not sure maybe one other time in all my years of ministry, is because in the early 1980s, Larry Montgomery came to the Monet Fundamental Methodist Church to preach a revival. And one night of the revival, he preached on this old boy, and he painted such a beautiful picture. There was an 80-some-year-old woman that sat over here on this side, and she got happy during the service. And I have that on tape. Beth says she knows where the tape is. And if we find it, one Sunday night, I'm going to play that for this church. It would be worth your time to be here. But Brother Larry Montgomery, it threw him off. This woman got to shouting and going around the church while he was preaching about this old boy. And uh, he got thrown off and almost lost his train of thought. Because he hadn't seen shouting like that in a long time. Well, <clears throat> I can't revisit those days. I can't go back to those again. <laughs> but I want to show you today that this man here, the only thing that caused him to be well, to cause him to be healed, was faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing else to it. It was not the power in Peter. It was not the power in John. And we know there's no silver or gold that that uh, exchanges hands here. There's nothing there except this man simply put his faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that did it. And I want to leave you today with this as you leave uh, and you go your way today. If you're not saved, I want you to know it's easy to be saved. I want you to know there is nothing more to it than you putting your faith your confidence in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. What He did for you on the cross. When He hung there and He made seven utterances and that seventh utterance was, it is finished. The plan way of salvation was complete. It was wrapped up. It was a done deal. And today all that a person has to do is simply place their faith in what Jesus did for them. Now I want to give you just a few things here very quickly this morning. I've got a lot of scripture, but it won't take me long to get through it. I want to show you some things that are very important about this story. For those of you who may not be, and I'm not trying to, to pick on anybody, but maybe you're not as familiar with your Bible as you ought to be, the previous chapter, chapter number 2, is where we come in to the day of Pentecost. It's where Peter is preaching a sound gospel message on what the Jews have done to their Savior. And he leaves them with a guilty feeling uh, and knowledge that they have crucified their Messiah. And yet they need to realize that it was God's plan all along that His Son would die upon the cross and now it was time for them to receive their Savior. There are 3,000 or 5,000, something like that, that come and they place their faith in Jesus that day. They begin to turn away from the not really their Jewish beliefs, but they're going to realize now that everything that they've been taught has now been revealed in Jesus Christ. And it's making the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish rulers, it's making them quite upset because they had a hog tie. These people, they had a hog tie into believing what they wanted them to believe. I, I probably could go all day long without trying to offend somebody. 
But I just want to tell you, if you're not aware of this, and I don't say it as much here in Cassville as I did when I pastored in Monette. We have a lot more Catholics in uh, Monette than you do in, in uh, Cassville, I believe. But I want you to know, if you're not aware of this, that the Catholic people, just the normal congregation, were not allowed to carry their own scripture, a copy of the scriptures, until just about a hundred years ago. It was a relatively new thing that the people in the pew were allowed to have a copy of the scriptures. And the reason was, was because the priest would say, here's what it says, and they had to believe him. That's the way it was with the Jewish rulers as well. They just had, the people had to go by with what the Jewish rulers, their scribes and Pharisees, were telling them about the things of God. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost gets involved. And he comes and he sits on the 120 disciples as if it were cloven tongues of fire. And they get up out of the upper room and they go out into the streets of Jerusalem and they begin to preach in every man's language. There were people from Judea and Samaria and uttermost parts of the world that were there uh, that day. And every man heard the gospel in his own language. And the gospel went, began to be spread that day. Now, I'm going to jump ahead some time. But later on in history, not too many years down the road, there's going to be a young man by the name of Saul of Tarsus that's going to take a real hating to these new Christian people. And he's going to start asking papers of the governors there to go out and arrest these Christians. And what happens is the church is scattered. And that also was God's will. It wasn't supposed to just stay in Jerusalem. God wanted them to scatter. But anyway, what happened was, it says in the last part of chapter number 2, well, let me just read it, verses 46 and 47. It says, and they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Where were Peter and John headed this day when they found the lame man at the gate of the temple called Beautiful? They were headed to the temple. It says that after the day of Pentecost, all the Jewish people that were saved that day continued in one accord and they went to the temple of God. And they broke bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what is happening here? Right before we see this man at the beautiful gate of the temple get healed, what's happening? The disciples are continuing to be faithful. I want to say something to you, my friends, that I've been here eight and a half years, something like that, maybe a little bit longer. It was June, I believe, of 2010 when Leonard Day called me on the phone and Charles Christman had given my name to some folks down here. And I came down here and I preached for two months and then the first Sunday in August, somebody told me I'd been voted in as pastor. I didn't know anything about it. They just said, congratulations. And I've been here all that time. Amen. In eight and a half years, whatever it's been, we've seen very few, very few people come to this altar and get up and say, I've asked Jesus Christ into my heart and my life. We've had a lot of people come down here and pray about illness, sickness, lost loved ones, whatever it might be. The altar's been used, don't get me wrong. But listen, my friend, I don't know about you, but my heart's desire is to see people come down here with a broken and a contrite spirit and say, I've just heard the good gospel. <clears throat> I've heard the good news that I need to be saved and get up and turn around and say, I've just asked Jesus into my heart. I, I long for those days. Do you yes. not? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but listen, friend, until that day happens, what are we supposed to do? Just give up, quit, quit coming back? We are supposed to be faithful to the house of God. Yeah. Keep on witnessing. Keep on uh, inviting people. Doing what you can. Pray for the lost. By the way, if you never look at our church bulletin, <coughs> the first thing it says on a prayer request is the lost. That ought to be our number one concern. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not going to try to cover all of our prayer requests this morning, but I did kind of drop the ball on this because we had a lot of prayer requests this morning. Jeremy Hilburn's girlfriend, Evita, over in Ireland, uh, about two years ago, her brother took his own life. He had one boy. Last night, that boy took his life. 
you remember that family. Sister Sharon over here has her own heartaches. Bob Cantwell has uh, uh, colon cancer. Uh, those are people that you all know. Darcy, what was the young man's name that got that got beat up in Springfield? Brandon Horn. Brandon Horn. <coughs> Sister Patty Brown. Roger's not with her today because he's sick. Her sister Betty lost someone uh, just, was it yesterday? Friday. Friday. That's been very dear to her. Someone who's been a companion to her uh, for 21 years. Listen, we've got all kinds of things here that we can pray about. Amen? Amen. But I'll tell you what, I, I long to see people <laughs> saved. Well, here's old Peter and John, and I bet they woke up on this morning thinking, wasn't yesterday great? Wasn't yesterday wonderful? When Larry Montgomery preached this message in Monette years ago, there was shouting all over the house that night. That little 85-year-old woman made her rounds around here. And I'll tell you again, if I ever find the tape, I'm going to play it for you all because it would be worth your time to be here and hear it. Larry Montgomery came back the next night and he preached and we had a packed house because of what had happened the night before. He preached his heart out. He had to beg for amens. Was there shouting? No, there was more snoring than there was shouting. I'm telling you what, and he stood there and he said, I want to tell you what, folks, it's not the first time <coughs> that I've encountered this. You have a great service one night, and the next night you come back and it's dead as a hammer. But it wasn't that way with Peter and John. They were talking on the way to the temple. Wasn't that wonderful what we saw God do yesterday when people heard the gospel in their own language <coughs> and great things that were accomplished? Here they come up to the beautiful gate of the temple there. And here's this man. By the way, if you go over into the next chapter, it says that he was above 40 years old. And it said that he had been lame since his mother's womb. This young man had never walked on his own. But because of their faithfulness, God was getting ready to do something in this man's life. That's why it's so important that you and I continue to be faithful. David said this in Psalm 55, 17. He said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. It says that Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. There were uh, several times during the day when they had time of prayer. I believe it was 9 a.m., it was noon, and it was 3 o'clock. And because of this scripture where David said that I will cry out unto you in the evening, morning, at noon. They believe that's why the Jewish tradition got started of three times a day. <clears throat> and by the way, this is still to be a house of prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen? Jesus said unto them in Matthew 21, 13, He said, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. By the way, that's a true statement about some churches today. It's not about the gospel anymore. It's not about sharing the gospel. It's all about money. It's all about raising funds. You don't think that's true? Watch some of these false prophets that are on your television. There's one old boy. He has gotten, and I, and I do not mean to offend when I say this at all, so please don't be offended. But this man is a false prophet and he has taken ignorant and unlearned black people and he has taken every dollar that they'll give him. He promises them everything but the moon. And they are just uh, ignorant. They don't have any education whatsoever. They have nothing. Uh, they're just trusting this little boy and they're just giving all their money to him. And he's on TV every day if you'll just turn it on. Isn't that a shame? Yes. God's house is to be called a house of prayer. There's people that have turned it into a den of thieves. It's not even about the gospel anymore. Now I want to share something with you real quick. It says that this man was above 40 years old. And I want you to know that time doesn't matter. If you're here today and you're not saved, <coughs> and you're above 40 years old, time doesn't matter with God. God can save you. We've got an old boy sitting here today that was 65 years old when he asked Jesus into his heart and life. Amen. Amen. Paulus, ain't that right? right? And it was because of dear friends in this church and some that used to attend this church that they would not give up on Hollis Matthews. They went to his house. They prayed for him. They witnessed to him. 
And they went over there, and right there in your own living room, you got saved, didn't you? Amen. Let me tell you, Acts 9.33 says, And there was found a, a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy, but he got healed. Matthew 9.20, And behold, a woman which was diseased with a... <clears throat> Issue of blood, 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment, and she got healed. <clears throat> Luke 13, 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bound together and could no wise lift herself up, but she got healed. John 5, 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years, but he got healed. John 9, 1, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, but he got healed. This man here was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shewed. We went all the way from 8 years to 40 years. It don't matter how old you are. If you're not saved today, God wants to save you. Amen. Amen. Well, there was a promise fulfilled here as well. I want you to look at verses 4 through 6. Verses 4 through 6 says, Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. <clears throat> now, I want you again look at verse number 4. Peter, along with John, fastened their eyes on him and said, Look on us. God's word says, and Jesus said it in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Amen. There was Peter and there was John. That makes two. They encouraged this lame man to place his faith in Christ. That made three. Jesus was right in the midst of them. That is a promise from the Word of God. And I believe that with all my heart. And I'm so thankful that we got 61 people here at this little country church today. But I guarantee you that God's Word is so true that if no more than three of us had shown up today, He said, I'd be with you. Amen. And what happens when He's with you? He can do great things, can he not? Amen. What about his name? Acts 3.16 And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now this is, that's a scripture about this very same guy. The very same chapter, verse 16 down there, Peter said, that his name, Jesus' name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. It was his faith that did it. Acts 4.10, the next chapter, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. It's the same man that they're talking about. <clears throat> because of what Jesus did, he said, this man is standing here before you whole. Ezekiel 7, 19. How many of you got a bulletin when you walked in today? Turn it over. Ezekiel 7, 19 is on your bulletin. Or maybe it's on the inside, wherever Beth puts that scripture. For those of you who did not get a bulletin, here's what it says. They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. And with the whole thing he's talking about there is that they thought that money is what this young man needed, what this man about 40 years old it's the reason he's standing there or sitting there and he's holding up his cup hoping that these religious people of anybody in the country it'd surely be the religious folks that would drop a penny in his cup. But Peter and John came along and Peter said, I don't have any silver and I don't have any gold and that's not what you need anyway. What you need is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was it. 
That's really good news for a lot of us, isn't it? Because a lot of us don't have no silver in their gold, do we? I'm glad I got faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, verse 20, but Peter said unto him, Oh, and let me tell you what this is about. There was a guy by the name of Simon the Sorcerer. And he started following the Apostle Peter and others around. And uh, a sorcerer was one that did magic tricks, if you will. He starts following Peter and John around. And he notices that Peter and the other apostles lay their hands on people. And they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden they start talking in unknown tongues and doing miraculous things. And Simon came up to Peter and he said to him, uh, here is money. Give me this gift whereby when I touch people they also shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> and Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. <coughs> this young man, I say young, he was above 40, sitting there laying at the beautiful gate of the temple. He thought he needed money to take care of his problem, but it wasn't money at all. By the way, Simon went ahead to, excuse me, Peter went ahead to tell Simon the sorcerer, he said, Thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And if you'll break that down and put it in, in plain English, uh, what he was saying was, you're a sinner that needs to be saved. Tell you something else it says about Simon the sorcerer. It says, and he believed. Before he ever offered money to Peter to get this gift, it says, and he believed. I want to tell you something. His belief was 18 inches from where it could really have changed his life. He believed up here. He needed to believe down here. Uh -huh. That was the difference right there. When I got saved at the age of 21, I already knew that Jesus was the Son of God. I already knew that the devil was the bad guy. I already knew that I had to be saved. I already knew that water baptism was a good thing. I already knew a lot of the things about the Word of God. But when I got saved on May 11th, 1981, that belief transferred from here to here. Amen. And I believed it in my heart. <clears throat> now, very quickly... One more thing and then I'm going to close. You see, the exciting thing about this story is that there was proof that he was healed. There was proof. I believe that there ought to be proof that someone got saved. I think there ought to be some kind of a change. I think there ought to be something that's evident there that shows that a person's life has been transported and transferred or whatever, uh, translated by the power of God. I knew it in me. I knew it in me. I didn't even recognize myself. I thought, who is this guy? When I got saved. I've seen it in other people when they got saved. They gave this up. They gave that up. They, they started being faithful to the house of God. They started reading God's Word. They, they gained a hunger for the things of God. They loved God's people. They loved God's house. Whatever. But there's a change that takes place when a person gets saved. Well, <clears throat> there was a change that took place when this old boy's feet and ankle bones received strength. And the Bible says that he stood, and then he went walking, and then he went leaping, and then he went praising God through the temple. And by the way, it never says that Peter and John were holding on to his arms as training wheels. He didn't need no help any longer. Over 40 years old, never walked one time, and his feet and ankle bones received strength just like that. It was immediate. That's the way salvation is, by the way, too. When you believe, you're saved right then. You don't get partially saved today and partially saved next week. You don't get the Holy Ghost that way. A little bit of Him today and a little bit of Him tomorrow. Listen, when you get saved, you get saved. And there ought to be evidence of that salvation. Acts chapter 4, verse 14, it's about this same man. And it says, And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Now I'm telling you, it's talking about the religious elite here. They wanted to. They wanted to gripe and complain. They wanted to throw a hissy fit. But it says they saw him standing there and they couldn't say anything against it. 
Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 20, He said, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. I believe that we ought to know one another by the fruit of our life, don't you? Amen. And by the way, and here's probably where I'll get kicked out. I'll get voted out after I say this. <laughs> one of those fruits that proves that you're a child of God doesn't mean that you go to a Baptist church. <laughs> Now, you want to sit down you want to talk about it with me later, I'll sit down and we'll have a long conversation. But I want to tell you, one of the greatest times in my life where God's wisdom came on me because I'm not smart enough to come up with something like this was I was under attack for my stand against women preachers and I was, uh, as I was under attack because we had an issue in the church where I was pastoring where we had a family who had twin boys and they were raised in a Bible-believing church. And one of them married Catholic and went Catholic. The other one married Lutheran and went Lutheran. And I would not allow them to come and minister to our congregation. I just couldn't do it. If I'm going to preach against what they believe, I cannot let them stand in the pulpit. Amen. I'm sorry. I hope you understand that. That's just crazy. Yeah. But their daddy got his feelings hurt. And he stood right in front of me at a big church meeting and he said, do you believe that all Catholics go to hell? And I looked right at him and I said, what I believe is, is if you're born again, you go to heaven. Amen. Amen. Now, do I encourage people to get out of the Catholic Church or Lutheran Church? Absolutely. Sure. I'm sorry if I'm hurting your feelings. I, you can send me a nasty letter in the mail if you want to. Don't sign your name. I tell people to get out of the United Methodist Church. I tell people to get out of the United Presbyterian Church. Why? There are good people in them, yes. But what their hierarchy, what their doctrine has gone off to in these final days yep. is contrary to the Word of God. Right. They've embraced homosexuality. Some of them have gotten rid of the blood. It's all about a social thing anymore. So do I encourage people to come out of them? I sure do. But if you're in one of them and you're born again, you are saved. As tough as that is for me to say. I mean, that almost left a bad taste in my mouth. But you, one of the fruits of the Spirit is not that you're a Baptist. It's that you're born again. Amen. And Isaiah 35, verse 6 says this. It's a prophecy that was fulfilled with this man, with his healing. It says, Then shall the lame man leap as an heart. We study about the heart. In Sunday school this morning, H A R T. It's the European version of a deer. It says, Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And if you will read that verse over and over again, what God's word was trying to tell us was things that were thought impossible will become possible. A man who's been lame since his mother's womb, over 40 years old, nobody will ever believe it, but he'll walk. People who were chained as lunatics would break those chains and run through the tombs and cut themselves, will one day sit and be clothed and in their right mind. It's all because of what Jesus did. There will be a woman that will walk bowed over, vote over for 18 years, but one day she'll come in contact with Jesus and she'll stand straight up. There will be a woman that will have an issue of blood for 12 years, but she'll sneak up behind Christ in a crowd and she'll touch the hem of his garment and her issue of blood will be gone. There will be a man by the pool of Siloam and he will be waiting for an angel to come down and churn the water so that he can be the first in there to be healed. But he won't make it there because one day Jesus will walk by and heal him on the spot. Amen. Uh -huh. Listen, I believe that we still serve a miracle working God. Yes. And I couldn't help, God help me, I don't want to cry during this time. And I don't mean to embarrass her, but I walked in here this morning and I was thinking about what I was getting ready to preach today. And I thought if I could walk over to Ruth and put my hand on her and say, be healed, I'd do it in a heartbeat. But you see, I don't possess that kind of power. I'm a preacher. I'm a man just like the rest of you men out here. I put my riches away one leg at a time. Only believe. 
Huh? All they believe. That's it. That's it. Believe. I believe. I believe that we serve a God that can still do great things. Amen. Amen. My point is, is if I could go over here and I could touch her and I had power, I'd do it. But I know. It's got to be all of us believing in, and God having His will and His way. Amen? Amen. Let's stand that first invitation. <laughs> Listen, maybe you're lame today. Maybe you're lame spiritually. <coughs> Would you like to come today and say, God, I need to be healed. I need to be healed of my sin problem. I need to ask Jesus into my heart and my life. Whatever your need may be, we invite you to come. Page 118. 118.